We'll be looking in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, what we're going to be looking at. I was, I've preached uh, these same verses before, actually back in November. And so if you've written in your Bible, and I hope you did write in your Bible, as you look, you'll say, well, man, he's already preached that before. And that's correct. I have used these verses before. But in my own private uh, Bible study time, I've been reading through the through the Bible, different books of the Bible, and I, I just happened to, uh, I just, just so happened, and the Holy Spirit led me there, um, to read through the book of Hebrews again. So I was reading through the book of Hebrews this week, and um, and already talked with uh, some of the leadership at church, and some of you had asked, well, can we go back to at least have Facebook Live? And it's kind of difficult to do Facebook Live if you don't have the proper equipment. So I said, I, I'll be glad to do that and, and fill in for that role. And as I was reading Hebrews chapter 10, God spoke to me and said, man, there's a verse that we need to go back and you need to look at again. So I'm not going to argue with the Holy Spirit. So as I sat down and tried to re-outline this, I, I just used the same outline I, I had before, except the last time I had two points, this time I have three points. But one thing that I know about man is this, that, that man is imperfect, he's evil, he's sinful. Man lies, cheats, steals, he deceives, he gossips, he grumbles, he judges, and he discriminates. Man hates, he assaults, he fights, and he kills. Man is selfish, he's hoarding, he's indulging, he's wasteful, he's polluting. Man seeks personal pleasure and denies pleasing God. Man can never live with a holy God. He is tar far too short of being perfect. So we can either accept our sentence or God's sacrifice. So I hope and pray this morning that you have accepted God's sacrifice and you're not accepting your own sentence. And as I look at these verses here, the first point that I see in verse 1 through 4 is the powerlessness of the old sacrifice. And it was an old sacrificial system that, that was used before Jesus came. And I want to read these verses for you. Verse 1 through 4 in Hebrews chapter 10. And it says this. It says, Since the law has only a shadow of good things to come, and not the reality of itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer each year. I'm going to read that one more time, but I'm going to leave out the middle part that's broke out by commas and just leave that out and listen with me one more time. Since the law has only a since the law only a shadow of the good things to come, it can never perfect the worshipers. The law can never perfect the worshipers. Let's go on to verse two. Otherwise, would they have stopped being offered? Since the worshipers, there that word is again, purified once and for all, would no longer have any conscience of their sins. Verse three. But, it, but the sacrifices, there is a reminder of the sins year after year. And it, it could be a reminder of your sins week after week, day after day. Um, but here, as they would go to the temple, they would go to have their sacrifices every year. And it was a reminder year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of the bulls and the goats to take away sin. In other words, it is impossible for the law to take away the sin. And as we struggle, every one of us struggle, I struggle, our church members struggle. We struggle with this time that we're going through right now that we can't join together as a, as a group of believers. And in Hebrews chapter 10, it tells us on over in verse 24, not to neglect the gathering together. So it tells us that we should gather together. Um, but we, I think a lot of times we don't know why we come to church um we fully maybe fully don't appreciate why we come to church what are we coming to church for what are we supposed to be doing and i believe hebrews is telling us exactly what we should be doing when we go back and we look at those uh, two words that were repeated over in chapter 10 and he calls our worshipers worshipers worship we go to church to worship that's what he is telling here and, and i can just imagine as he's talking to the to the jewish nation and trying to explain to them what they are supposed to do, um, they were pretty, they were confused. 
But as we look at these, there's a couple of things we're going to break down God's Word here. The first one we look at in, in the first part of verse 1 is the sacrifice was a representation. It was a shadow, and a shadow is an outline. It's a reflection of something that you're really not seeing. You're just seeing the outline of the reflection of it, but you know what it represents. Uh, this morning, Patton um, was watching Mickey Mouse in the Mickey Mouse Club, and I was sitting there looking at it, and I saw something, and I said, you know, I, I would say that is the uh, most recognized shadow, most recognized silhouette um, that is known to mankind, and it is the Mickey Mouse ears. You see those those little ears and that round circle, and those two little round circles on top, first thing you see is you say, hey, that's Mickey Mouse. No, it's not Mickey Mouse. That is a shadow of Mickey Mouse. That is what Mickey Mouse looks like, but that's not Mickey Mouse. It is something that replaces something that is real. That's what a shadow is. So when he's talking about this, it's a reputation of something that is real. And what is real is the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross, not the blood that these goats and, and, and animals shed. So it's a representation, but not a representation. It's also repetitive. He says, I have to do it year after year after year after year. I think that's kind of where we get hung up a lot of times. We, we think, well, we have to go to church day after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And we, we've shared this and we've said this laughingly. And, 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 but I'm serious as, as well that if we cancel church, if we cancel the gathering of the body for a few weeks, we're not going to die and go to hell. It is a representation of what we come to do uh, is to worship Him, and I, I mean, that's not even right. It's not a representation. It is what we do when we go to church. We go to worship Him. But I think a lot of times we, we view it as a representation of, well, I need to go to church. If I don't go to church, I can't ask for forgiveness and things like that. We can ask for forgiveness 24-7. We do not have to be in a church building to, to worship God. We don't have to be in a church building to to um, pray. We don't have to be in a church building to ask for uh, forgiveness of our sins. We should do that 24-7. We should be doing that all the time. One of the first sermons I preached as we went through this COVID is we need to learn how to have personal private worship. And once we understand our personal private worship and we can worship Him that way, then we can have public worship where we can gather to, with, with each other. But this, this, uh, this sacrifice was repetitive. It was also a reminder that they were never free. And it was also um, the sacrifice, how it was powerless was it never removed their sins. It never removed their sins. This week I was uh, talking with a good friend of mine, Dr. Joe McGee. Man, I have come to love Dr. Joe McGee. He is the director on mission that um, Constellation Baptist Association over in Jeff Davis County and reaches out in Appling County. And Man, he has come to help Lumber City Baptist so much, and, and I probably speak to him a couple of times a week. And he shared with me about a guy by the name of uh, Elias Keach. Elias Keach. Elias Keach come to the United States back in the 1600s, and his father was Benjamin Keach. Keach. And um, his father was kind of a radical guy in England. And can you believe that he did this? He thought that it would be a good idea to sing hymns in church because we could learn the Bible that way. And a lot of the Baptists didn't think that was a good idea. My, have to have times have changed. Um, but, but that's what his father brought to church, and his father was a renowned preacher in London. And um, Elias tried to get away from all of that stuff, so he came to America. And uh, he came to America, and, and, and he was broke. He didn't have anything, but he did have some of his father's clothes or Either he had some of his father's clothes and he wore the little white collar that the Baptist ministers used to wear in those days, or, or either he dressed up to pretend to be one. Either way, to get a job. But people started noticing who he was, and they said, well, man, if your daddy was a great preacher, um, why couldn't you just preach as well? So he jumped in there, and the story goes that his first sermon that he preached there, and I think it was Philadelphia, the first sermon he preached, halfway through the sermon, he just stopped. And the people thought he had, had gotten ill and he fell to the floor. And as he fell to the floor, they rushed to his side to see what was going on. And he said, I'm not sick. I just got saved. And here was a man that was converted by his own preaching. See, he had grown up in church all of his life. His daddy was a great minister. 
But yet he did not know the Lord until the Holy Spirit spoke to him, drew him. And then when the Holy Spirit drew him, he accepted what he was reading. And he was probably more than likely just re-preaching one of his daddy's sermons. Um, so here was a man that, that did all of the legalistic things that he needed to do to be saved, but yet wasn't saved. And then when the Holy Spirit drew him, he, 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 he came to know Jesus Christ. He was later baptized, and that is where the first um, convention or, or first group of Baptists kind of started, and he was kind of known as a patriarch of that. And you can read about that in, in history. But So we see the, imp uh, the, the imperfections or the powerlessness of the, of the old sacrifice. Now I want us to look at the perfection of the new sacrifice. Look with me in verse 5 of chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 5 through Five through ten. It says, Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, You did not desire sacrifices or offerings, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in the whole burnt offerings of sins. And then I said, See, it is written about me in the scrolls. And I have come to do your will, O God. And after he says above, you did not desire or did delight in the sacrifices of offerings and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, yes, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. And by this will, we, will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body in, of Jesus Christ once and for all. And so we see this verse here. It talks about a sacrifice that has to be given. But, but what I come to know or come to see this week, it says in verse 5, you did not delight in the worship and you did not delight in the whole burnt offering of sin, of the sin offering. He, didn't, he did not delight in the, in the uh, worship that they were doing. He, he, didn't, he, just, he didn't delight. That's not what he wanted. He knew it had to be over and over again. But what God was wanting was I'm going to prepare the perfect sacrifice. That sacrifice was going to be prepared by me. And when he prepared it, he sent Jesus down perfect in every way. And Jesus said, I'm going to do your will. If we want to grow closer to God, we don't grow closer to God by coming to church. We don't grow, grow closer to God only by coming to church. We don't grow closer to God only by singing. We, we grow cro closer to God by doing God's will. What is God's will in, in our life? It was some years ago during Awana uh, on a Wednesday night at Lumber City that a little kid uh, had asked her, Awana teacher, what does it mean to be in God's will? And that Awana teacher came to me and said, Brother Ashley, can you explain to this child what does it mean to be in God's will? And I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's real simple. I can do that. So I walked up to the little boy and I asked him, I said, what do you want to do when you grow up in life? What, what would you like to do? Then he said, I want to be a logger. Man, I just got all fired up. So that's great. We need more loggers in this world. Um, I said, man, that is just awesome that you want to be a logger. I said, but what does God want you to be? And the little boy looked at me and he said, well, what do you mean, what does God want me to be? I said, what does God want you to be? And he says, I don't, I don't know what God wants me to be. I said, you know why you don't know what God wants you to be? And he said, why? I said, you've never asked him. You never asked. If you want to know what God wants you to be, ask Him. Ask Him. But when you do ask Him, take the time to listen to what He says. And He speaks to us in a numerous ways. He speaks to us through friends. He speaks to us through our pastors. He speaks to us through His Word. He speaks to us by spending time alone with Him. He speaks to us through our parents. He even will speak to you if you're married through your spouse. But you need to take the time to listen to what God would have you to do. And you need to be in God's will. And if we are in God's will, we are doing exactly what God wants us to do. I think back in uh, about, um, and as I was doing some research about this Elias Keats, I thought about the old, what they call brush arbors in, in churches. And I, I kept looking for history and hooked for history. And as I was digging around and looking and I said, well, I noticed that way back in the 1700s in the state of Georgia, and I'm, on, I'm not sure about the number here, but it was a number like 50 or 60 Baptist churches in the state of Georgia or in this association at that time. And then I looked at the number of pastors that they had. They may have 50 or 60 churches, 
but they only had about 30 or 40 pastors. And I said, wow, that's kind of like where we're at today. We have all these churches that are needing pastors. And what the pastors would do, they would travel. And they would have church at this church. And then two weeks later, they would come back. But in the meantime, they would go to another church. And they, would, and they love preaching outside. Man, that's where I want to be. I want to be outside preaching. Um, but they would love to go outside and, and, and preach the gospel. But during those two weeks when the pastor wasn't there, what they did, they gathered in small family groups. And they may meet in a brush arbor somewhere. And, and some man, some father, some grandfather would open up the word. And as his family would gather together, that's the way they would, they would read God's word. And that's the way they would grow. And as I was talking to Brother Joe McGee this week, I said, Brother Joe, with COVID-19 like it is, is that what we're going back to? Where if we want to grow in the Lord, it's going to take some men some godly men to sit down with their families and open up God's word in their small family group. And until we can gather together as a group and then worship corporately, I don't know. That may be where, <coughs> where God is sending us right now. I, I, I don't have any clue, but we all need to be in God's will. And that's what he's saying right here. God delights when we're in his will. Um, another verse here that I wanted to, to read to us is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous. Now get that right now. There, there now. That's very important. You are not righteous. If you are sinned, if you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you are not righteous, but you have been declared righteous by faith. And we have peace with God through our own Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus came to do God's will and we should come, we should do God's will as well and know that we are declared righteous and we are going to make mistakes, but it is okay. Those mistakes will not be held against us because of the declaration that he has made for us. And the last point is this, verses 11 through 14, the promise of the new sacrifice, the promise of the new sacrifice, verses 11 through 14. Starting in verse 11, every priest stands day after day, ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, let's stop right there. I, when I see this, it's the, pre, the preacher. The preacher goes every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday, but the preacher cannot save you from your sins. But... This man, this man being Jesus, offered one, one sacrifice, and then he sat down. He sat down because the job was finished. Now, he didn't sit down and say, the job finished, you don't have to go to church anymore. That's not what it says. We get on over here, we'll see where we're supposed to gather together. But salvation does not come from going to church. Salvation comes from accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. Verse 14 says this, For by one offering he has perfected forever." He has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Those who are sanctified. I can just imagine, as, and I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, I can just imagine as he was talking to his audience here, there was probably some, some new converts, some new Christians there, and he was speaking to them, and, and they may have been 40, 50, 60, 80 years old, and I can imagine every year they went to the temple, and as they went to the temple to present their sacrifices, it was hard for them to get out of that habit of going for that. And what Paul was telling them was this, going to the temple, doing all those right things, aren't getting you any closer to God. They are not saving your soul whatsoever. What's going to save your soul is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then being inside of God's will and doing what he would ask you to do and what he wants you to do. And he finds delight in that. You know, I don't know that. I know this. If all we do seven days a week, if all we do is get up and go to church and we sit there and then we turn around and leave, God does not delight in that. God delights that we are in his will. God has a will. God has a purpose, a plan, and he gives every person the power to be in his will. I don't know what, your, what God's will is for you. I don't necessarily know what God's purpose is for you. I will help you find that purpose. I challenged our deacons last year 
and even I'll do it even now at work if someone comes to me and they says, you know, I think we need to do this or we need to do that or I don't know what God wants me to do in my life. One of the things I'll tell them is this, and I've done this for myself and it's amazing to see God's hand work at doing this. Write it down. Write down on a piece of paper what you think God wants you to do. Just, just write it down. Pray about it. Meditate on it. And then as you write that down, then I want you to write down the struggles or the obstacles that may come before that. Now, I'm not saying that these struggles or these obstacles are going to stop you from doing it, but they are struggles and they are obstacles. And I believe if God's called you to do something, he's called you to do something that's going to be supernatural, something that you can't do on your own. So there's going to be obstacles there. And then I want you to write down on top of that, right after that, some of the things that, 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 that you think you can do to overcome those obstacles and then pray about it. And then I want you to do this and I'll, I'll go this step to give it to me, call me, message me, email me, say, brother, Ashley, I want to sit down and I want to talk to you about what God has laid on my life as my ministry to do. And I will go right along beside you and I'll pray with you and we'll look at it and I'll do everything in my power to help you accomplish the the ministry that god has put on your heart and god will delight in that but i want to tell you this in closing that if you don't trust jesus christ as your lord and savior today may be the day of salvation you may be just like elijah Keach, who grew up in church his father was a pastor your daddy may have been a deacon your dad your mama may be a sunday school teacher but you've come to realize that you know what i don't know jesus christ as my lord and savior Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says this, Confess with your mouth that He is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, and you shall be saved. Salvation is for everyone, and for everyone that accepts Him, Jesus is faithful to forgive you of your sins and to welcome you with open arms into His kingdom. And then as we go, and I want to read these last verses with you so we don't leave this off, is Hebrews chapter 10. It says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confessions of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting the gathering together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. That's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to come together and we are supposed to lift each other up in love. And you may have to do that right now in your own home. You may have to do that at where you work or where you go to school. But this COVID-19 will pass. The storm will pass. And when it passes, it will be so much better for it. James chapter 1 verse 2 says this, Consider it great joy when you have trials of any kind, because it builds up your endurance. It'll make us stronger people. And Lumber City Baptist Church family and those families that are out there watching this morning, I want you to know one thing. I love you, and I care for you greatly and dearly. If there's anything I can ever do for you, please don't hesitate to call me or text me or let me know. So be with us. Encourage each other. And God bless.